Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see everybody here. Today, based on 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, I'm going to share with you a message entitled, The Firstborn of Israel. Okay, The Firstborn of Israel. So we're in the midst of studying from book 6 of the History of Redemption series. And the first part of book 6 covers uh, the genealogy in the book of Chronicles. And right now, we're on chapter 5. So what's chapter 5 or 1 Chronicles uh, about? Well, it's about the, the genealogy of the tribe of Reuben. And as we read today, Reuben was Israel's firstborn. Um, but he lost his birthright because the Bible says he defiled his father's bed. So if you keep reading throughout the chapter... It talks about the rise and fall of Reuben and the tribe of Reuben. If you look in Genesis chapter 49, verses 3 and 4, it says, Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Up to that point, that's, I mean, that's like a great blessing, right? His father, Jacob, who is right now inspired by the Holy Spirit to say these things as he's blessing all of his sons. He says, Reuben, you're my firstborn. You're, you're my might, the beginning of my strength. You're preeminent. It means he's the best, right? But then starting in verse 4, it says, but he was uncontrolled as water. So you shall not have preeminence. See, he was born with preeminence. But because he couldn't control his, himself, he lost his preeminence because you went up to your father's bed and you defiled it. So he was given the blessing of the firstborn, but he lost it because he couldn't control himself. So the firstborn is the beginning of the father's strength and power and might. And that's who Reuben was. Reuben was born with all these things but he threw it all away, right? So if you keep reading in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, uh, it shows how Reuben succeeded at, at one point in time. For example, in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 20, it says, this is talking about the tribe of Reuben. They were helped against them, and the Hagrites and all who were with them were given into their hand. So Reuben, the tribe of Reuben went to conquer the land that God permitted for them, uh, the, a people called the Hagrites were living there. They were mighty people, but when Reuben went and fought against them, they, he was able to win. Why? Because it says they cried out to God in the battle, and he answered their prayers because they trusted in him. See? They trusted in God, so they were able to have victory. See, this is what we need to understand. The source of all of our strength and power, abilities, is God himself. When we trust in him, all those things that he has given to us will come out, we'll be able to use that. But when we do not trust in God and trust in ourselves, that preeminence, the strength, will disappear. So at first, Reuben, the tribe of Reuben was like this. They trusted in God, they were victorious, but this didn't last long. After a while, they didn't do that, right? So in verse 25, five verses later, it says, but they acted treacherously against God, against the God of their fathers, and played the harlot, right? It means he committed adultery against God. Played the harlots after the gods of the peoples of the land, whom God had destroyed before them. Now think about this. They just beat these people because God helped them, they were able to drive them out. So if you beat them, why would you accept their gods and worship their gods? It, it doesn't make sense, right? I don't understand why they would do this. But this is how people are. So you see, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, this is like the second to the last verse here. The entire chapter, the first verse begins with Reuben defiling his father's bed. So First verse begins with Reuben's physical adultery. 
And then the last verse, or the second to the last verse at least, ends with Reuben's spiritual adultery. So this is something that I can't really explain, but I've seen over and over again. And what is that? Physical adultery usually leads to spiritual adultery. If you don't repent right away, physical adultery leads to spiritual adultery. So we need to repent of our sins immediately, right away. Because sin begets more sin and more serious sin, stronger sin. That's what we see in the life of Reuben and the tribe of Reuben. So today I want to talk about the, the firstborn of Israel. What is a firstborn? What is a firstborn? Who can become a firstborn? All right. So number one, what is a firstborn? The word in and of itself, it just means, uh, you know, a son or daughter that's born first, right? But in the Bible, it doesn't signify first in physical birth. That's not what it means. In the Bible, it has a different meaning. So what does it mean? Well, the firstborn is the son that will continue the father's work. Okay? See, in ancient times, if your father was a carpenter, you become a carpenter. If your father was a priest, you become a priest. This is how it was in ancient days. It's not like that today, but that's how it was. So the firstborn is the one who will continue the father's business. So if the father was a king, the firstborn will be the next king. If the father was a priest, the firstborn will be the next priest. So the firstborn is the one who continues the father's work. But for us, who is our father? God himself, right? God is our father, right? So who is God's firstborn? It is the one who will continue God's work here on earth, who will continue God's covenant here on earth. So in that sense, Adam was God's firstborn. Not only was he the first person, but he was also God's firstborn. Why do we say that? Because if you look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, etc., etc., See, the word rule here means you are a king. So God is the king of kings, right? And when God created Adam, he wanted Adam to become the ruler who will rule on God's behalf. God wanted to take a step back and rest, and he wanted to have Adam rule the world on God's behalf. That was God's intention when he created Adam. So the firstborn continues the father's work. He represents the family, right? But what happened to Adam? The serpent came and deceived him and spiritually killed him, right? So in essence, Satan killed God's firstborn, spiritually speaking. So that's why when God was bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, what was the last plague that he brought upon Egypt? It was the plague of the firstborn, right? All of the Egyptians' firstborns died. Why? Basically, God was paying Satan back. Because you killed my firstborn, I will take vengeance upon you. And then after Adam, the Bible says Israel was God's firstborn, right? In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, God says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And what did God want Israel to be? What kind of a nation did God want Israel to be? He wanted Israel to be a kingdom of priests. So first, a king, God created Adam to rule like a king, and God wanted Israel to be his priests, to serve God, 
as a mediator between God and other human beings. And in the New Testament, the same duty is given to us now, the Christians, believers of Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, you, right, you, that's talking to us, all of us who believe in Jesus, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, We, God has called us to become his firstborn. He wants us to serve him as his priests, as mediators between God and the unbelieving world. He wants us to represent him so that wherever we go, we bring out the glory of God. That's a very big responsibility. We are to reveal God's light and his glory to the world. So, who can become this kind of firstborn? Who can become the firstborn? When we look at the Bible from the beginning, we see that the physical birth order doesn't matter, right? Who was the firstborn of Adam? It was Cain, right? But he was not the spiritual firstborn. It's always like this. So why is that? So for example, in regards to Cain and Abel, Cain was the physical firstborn, but he lost that firstborn birthright, like Reuben, right? So why did he lose it? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, it says, It came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. So God ordered both Cain and Abel to bring sacrifices to him. The Bible says Cain brought an offering, just an offering, just plain old offering. But what kind of offering did Abel bring? In the very next verse, it says, Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. Basically, what this last sentence means is God accepted Abel's offering, did not accept Cain's offering. What was the reason? The difference between these two offerings was that this word, firstlings and fat portions, was not part of Cain's offering. So what does that mean? Firstlings and fat portions signify the best of the best. Abel brought the first and the best that he had for God. Whereas Cain just brought an offering, just a plain, you know, he took the best for himself and just brought one of the offerings. So that was the difference. So in other words, this offering reflects the state of Abel's heart. And what was the state of Abel's heart? God was first in Abel's heart. That's why God accepted Abel as his firstborn. Whereas in Cain's heart, he himself was first in his heart, not God. So is God first in our hearts today, right now? That's what we need to be thinking about. And then the The second um, pair of brothers is Jacob and Esau. They were twins, right? And Esau was the firstborn, but he lost his birthright, just like Reuben. We all know this story, right? So in Genesis chapter 25, verses 30 through 32, it says, And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm about to die, so of what use then is the birthright to me? So here, the difference was this. Esau regarded fleshly desires and material things more than the spiritual blessing of the firstborn. Whereas the Jacob was willing to give up his material things in order to gain the spiritual blessing. That's why Jacob became the firstborn. So what is first in our hearts? What's the most important in our lives? Is it the spiritual blessing 
receiving God's word and increasing our faith and receiving the spiritual blessings from God? Or is it all about the material wealth and the physical things of this world? Esau represents that kind of a person. That's why he lost his firstborn birthright. Third pair of brothers is Reuben and Joseph. As we know, Reuben was the firstborn out of the 12, right? Joseph was the 11th son. But what did Reuben do? Reuben defiled his father's bed. He had relations with one of his father's concubines. But what did Joseph do? Well, Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt. He became a slave in Potiphar's house. But because he, was, uh, he worked so well, Potiphar entrusted Joseph with everything he had. Joseph was in charge of everything in Potiphar's house. But then Potiphar's wife fell in love with Joseph and kept asking him to sleep with her. And this was Joseph's response. In Genesis 39, verse 9, he says, There is no one greater in this house than I. And he, meaning her husband, Potiphar, he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? See, we have to listen carefully to Joseph's answer. He's saying, I could have whatever I want in, th in this house because Potiphar put me in charge of everything. If I want, I could just take all of this. And he wouldn't say anything except for one thing, that is the wife, you. So how can I sin against Potiphar? He should have said that, right? But he didn't. He said, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? See, Joseph was living before God at every moment of his life. He believed that God was watching him at every moment of his life. So he was living in front of God. So Reuben could not control his fleshly desires and lusts, whereas Joseph was able to let go of his desires to do the will of God. So if you look at all three of these examples, it's about the choice you make. What choice are you going to make? That determines if you're a firstborn or not. Is it going to be my belly like Esau? Or will it be the spiritual blessings that God is in store? Or is it going to be my fleshly desires like Reuben? Or will it be like Joseph to not sin before God? So the Bible says Reuben defiled his father's bed. Father's bed symbolizes his authority. So Reuben basically challenged his father's authority. And this is basically like, if you look at Joseph's story, this is basically the same choice that God gave to Adam regarding the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What did God say to Adam? He said, you could have any tree in the garden you want. You could eat from it wherever, whenever you want, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the same wording, right? Joseph had control over anything in the house except for Potiphar's wife. Adam took from that one thing God told him not to, to eat from, whereas Joseph didn't. Adam made the wrong choice. Joseph made the right choice. That's why Joseph is the spiritual firstborn. So, today then, how can we recover the blessing of the firstborn? Because we're all Adam's descendants. We lost that because Adam fell. Now, how can we recover that firstborn blessing? There are two ways to do this. One is an external way, and then the second is an internal way. So the first way is out in the world, externally, what we do out in the world. Second is internally, what we do in our hearts. So let's look at the example of two twins that appear in the Bible. The first twin is Jacob and Esau, right? 
Jacob and Esau were twins. They were fighting within the womb of their mother, right? In Genesis 25, verse 22, it says, The children struggled together within her. And she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord, right? So Jacob and Esau were fighting inside the womb before they were even born. They were fighting to see who would come out first. But what happened? Esau came out first, right? So Esau came out, and then afterward, his brother Jacob came forth with his hand holding onto Esau's heel. See, this is how we can know that that's what they were fighting for. Jacob wanted to come out first, so he was holding onto his heel. So because Jacob lost that battle in the womb, now he has to fight that battle out in the world. Okay? He has to now fight to regain that firstborn right out in the world. So because Adam lost to the serpent, now the serpent is the firstborn of this world. Satan is the firstborn of this world. He has control over this world. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? See, Adam obeyed the serpent, right? So Adam became the serpent's slave. Thus, he lost his firstborn rights. That's why we need to fight out here in the world, battle and struggle to regain that firstborn right. So how do we do that? The way to do that is to obey God even in the face of trials and persecutions, just like Joseph. The Bible says, Everybody who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So all true believers will have trials and tribulations and persecutions in this world. And even in the midst of such hardships, we have to obey God. Because these trials and tribulations are what enables our hearts to be changed and conform to the image of Christ. So what we need to do is obey God by humbling ourselves before God. What did Jesus do here on earth? Jesus said even he had trials and persecutions and hardships. And what did he do? He humbled himself even more and he became a servant. So in John 16, verse 33, says, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. See, Jesus has overcome the world. So we need to follow in his example, right? And his example is this. In Mark 9, 35, he says, Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. See, if you want to be the firstborn, then like Jesus, we need to become the servant. We need to humble ourselves. That's the way to recovering the firstborn rights here in the world. But what about now internally? What do we need to do? The second pair of twins that I'm going to talk about is Perez and Zara. Who are Perez and Zara? They are the twins that Judah had with Tamar, right? Remember the story? Tamar was actually Judah's daughter in law, but they had relations and she had twins. Their names were Perez and Zara. Now, in Genesis chapter 38, verses 27 through 30, It says that it came about at the time she was giving birth that, behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth. One put out a hand, right? One of them put out a hand. And the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But then it came about as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out. Then she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out, 
who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah. So these two were again fighting in the womb to see who would come out first. Zerah almost came out first, but what happened? It got turned around, right? And Perez came out first. And Perez is the rightful firstborn. So his name was included in Jesus' genealogy. So in this case, it was different from Jacob's case. Whereas Jacob lost, so he had to fight to regain that birthright out in the world. But in this case, Perez won inside the womb. So he came out first, as God had desired. So what does this mean for us? Why, why do we need to know this? Why does this have any significance for us today? This is showing us the internal struggle that all of us are going through right now as descendants of Adam. When Adam fell, the order that God has established in the world got overturned. And what was the order? Human beings are made of spirit, soul, and body. The order that God had said was that our spirit will receive the spirit of God And through the Spirit of God, we will rule over our soul, and the soul will rule over our bodies. This was the order that God established at the beginning. Our spirit, with the Spirit of God, rules over the soul and over the body, so that our body, we live our lives led by the Spirit of God. That's the order. But when Adam fell and he sinned, that order got overturned. So that most of the time, it is our body that is in control. The spirit is the firstborn, the body is not. The spirit shall be ruling, but as fallen sinners, the body is ruling in us. The flesh is ruling in us. That's the fallen nature of mankind. This is what we need to overturn internally within ourselves. So Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, he says, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, right? The inner man wants to do God's will, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members, right? The body. So Paul says, I don't do the things that I want to do. I want to do God's will, but I don't do it because of my body, my flesh, the sin that is in it. So he's constantly struggling within himself to do God's will. That's the battle, the internal battle of the firstborn in all of us. This is the battle that we need to win. Then we could reveal God's glory out in the world. And how do we do that? As Paul said, and as I said this morning, we need to discipline our bodies with the word of God and with the help of the spirit of God. So who are the true firstborns? They are the ones that are led by the spirit of God, who live according to the spirit of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 13, it says, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See how ironic this is? If you put to death the deeds of the body, then you will truly come alive. That's what life of faith is all about. That's why we are here, trying to put to death the deeds of the body so that our souls can come alive. So in Romans 8, 14, it says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Those are the firstborns. Are we being led by the Spirit of God today? Or are we being led by the desires of the flesh? That determines whether you're a firstborn son of God or not. So it is my prayer that through the word and through prayer, that we are able to discipline our bodies, put it into submission so that the Spirit of God could rule over our lives, that our lives may be led by the Spirit of God, that we obey and do the will of God, 
And by so doing, may we all receive the blessing of the firstborn in every aspect of our lives. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace, and we thank you for the word that you have given to us today. As we have learned, we need your help to truly, truly live a life that is led by the Spirit of God. Father God, help us to put to death the deeds of our bodies through your word, through your spirit, and through prayer. Because we know that this struggle is too great for us. Many times we have failed. We cannot do this on our own. So at this time, we humbly seek your grace and your help in this battle. When the tribe of Reuben cried out to God and trusted in God, they were victorious. So I pray that you will enable all of our members of Evergreen Church to have that humble attitude, to cry out to you, to seek your help. And when we do so, may your spirit help us and lead and guide us so that we may be able to live our lives as the true firstborns of God. We thank you so much for all that you have given to us. And at this time, we are giving back a small portion as an offering to you. May this offering be given in faith, and may it be an offering like that of Abel, where you are pleased with what we are giving to you, so that we may all receive acknowledgement as the true firstborns. We thank you for everything, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.